Good morning. Good morning. It's a beautiful morning, a great morning. Oh, it wasn't. I heard some good prayers this morning. Heard some good Christ-centered singing. I'm ready to go home. <laughs> Isn't it sweet to be together and sing about the Lord Jesus Christ and worship with one another? Well, we've been doing a series on the Sermon on the Mount, hoping we can find a, a good flourishing way to live with God. I would ask that you turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. <clears throat> we've been learning the Christ-centered wisdom for the kingdom flourishing life is available to us through Christ. He's teaching us that wisdom in this, in this great sermon. I'm just going to begin by reading a couple of the verses. We're really going through 19 through 34. I'm just going to read the first couple here and then pray. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth, rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And Father, as we bow before you and continue in, the, in our spirit of worship this morning, we pray you would continue too to fill us with the power of the Spirit, that we would, be, that we would all be good disciples and good learners, that we would hear your word, that you'd apply it in our heart so that we'd learn how to flourish with you. And we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Some years ago, I heard a, a Kevin Miller tell a story. Kevin was uh, one of the managing editors at Christianity Today, and he was the man who hired Johanna and helped her career. But he would tell the story about his father. It goes something like this. There's, his dad wasn't a believer, and uh, he, would, he had a couple of stories he liked to tell him about money. And the first story was uh, a, an older couple who came to see the president of Harvard. And they had traveled from the West Coast to the East Coast. The president of Harvard didn't know who they were, and, but he received them in his office. Uh, but apparently he was rather curt towards them not knowing who they were or anything. And the wife turned to her husband and said, Leyland, I think we can find something better to do with our money. And they left. Now, as Kevin tells the story, you, you might think that this, the moral of this might be something like, no matter who the... Who, oh, I forgot to tell part of the story. Sorry about that. It was Leyland Stanford who went back to the West Coast and founded Stanford University. That's a pretty important part of the story, right? <laughs> but uh, I'm working on this story, you know. Where was I? So uh, you might think the moral of the story might be, be good, be good to anybody you don't know because maybe they're rich or something. But his dad's moral of that story was you want to have all the money you can because then you can stick it to anybody including the president of Harvard. That was his dad's moral. He had a second story, kind of like the first, only this one had a minister in it. And this minister went to see John D. Rockefeller. And driving up to this beautiful estate through the gates and the statues and fountains and coming up to the mountain or the uh, mansion, the minister said, wow, look at this. God could do this if he had this kind of money. And his dad's moral of that story was, Rockefeller has money and he has more power than God. So his dad wasn't a believer, but he made a tactical, fundamental error. One day, Kevin and his mother were going to church. They were going to a, an Episcopal church. And apparently this church had a, a priest that Sunday who was kind of an old-time gospel guy. And he preached Christ and had an altar call at the Episcopal Church. Kevin's father went with him that day, and he came to Christ. That does happen, doesn't it? <laughs> People come to Christ. And a year later, he told Kevin, I'm giving away a tenth of all I have. It's so exciting. God had changed his heart. Christ was at work. 
And he started giving money away, and he loved giving money away. He was excited about it. He came to Christ when he was 60. He died of a heart attack when he was 70, and Kevin was there at their visitation, and a lady came up to him and said, I want to tell you something I don't think anybody else knows about your father. He saved my life, literally. I was in a relationship with a guy who was beating me, and I, had, I didn't know what to do. He paid for all my classes at the community school and all my books, and he literally saved my life. You know, I, I tell that story that Kevin tells about his dad because this is the kind of text that tells us that God changes our lives. Christ changes our heart. We've been talking for these, whoa, almost two months, I think now, about how God does this from the inside out. He works in us, and Jesus is doing heart surgery, whether we're in him for three days or three decades. He's doing heart surgery on all of us. And if you don't remember anything else today, and I, I know that Jesus probably has a whole lot of one-liners that are really good, right? But for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If you walk away with that one today, you walk away with God's wisdom in your heart. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Well, the Bible says a lot of good things like this and a lot of wisdom. Jesus said we needed to build our house on the rock. James said, who is wise and understanding among you? But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to discussion, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. James the Apostle believed in the wisdom of Jesus Christ. And there he's writing about that need for wisdom. I have a quote this morning I wanted to show you. Let me see if you can guess where this quote came from. I have been driven many times to my knees by the overpowering conviction that I had nowhere else to go. My wisdom and that, my wisdom and that of all about me seemed insufficient for the day. A beautiful sense of the need for wisdom. Anybody recognize that one? I wouldn't really expect you to. But I'll give you a hint. We go back into the 1800s for this one. Uh, no, not even close. Sorry. <laughs> but that was a good man. <laughs> and you know, this guy, if you, if you only know one person in Illinois politics, this is the man you want to know. <laughs> yeah, that's Abraham Lincoln. And you know, we know what he went through in being the president during the Civil War. But all of us should identify with that statement. I need the wisdom of God in my life for every day, all about me. And, uh, you know, I, I know that he had a special relationship with a Presbyterian pastor during his presidency, and the suspicion is that he came to Christ in that, in that time. Well, we're, I wanted to mention some things here about wisdom. I want to talk a little bit more about it before I get into the text too far. Because we've spoken about how the, the Sermon on the Mount is like the book of Proverbs in that it is wisdom literature. And the early church understood that. They were acquainted, the Hebrews during Jesus' time, were acquainted with the book of Proverbs. They were used to wisdom literature, as were the Greeks were, although they thought of it more like value literature. And we believe that the Sermon on the Mount, Christ is giving us wisdom literature so that we can gain understanding of the will of God. And, and how to live. And that's why we say the Sermon on the Mount is Christ-centered wisdom for a kingdom flourishing life that he wants to give us. And I bet there's a whole lot of testimonies in the room that would say, it works. <laughs> it works. God gives you wisdom in Christ, and he changes and empowers our life. So our emphasis this week is on that wisdom, but particularly as it relates to money, a treasure, or wealth. Now, it's important that we have an attitude of a learner. 
all the time. And as we approach this text, even if we've read it many times or we've been around uh, the Bible or whatever, that we always look at the Word of God and say, God, I need this. Help me to be wiser, particularly about how I think about money. Well, Jesus gives us some pretty powerful warnings about money. He even says it's difficult to be rich and go to heaven at one point. We know the apostles talked to the church, and they they included the people who were wealthy, who who had an abundance, to be generous with that. So there was people around the church who had had wealth. And, you know, I kind of feel like that about myself today, (laughs) that uh, I might not be a wealthy man in terms of my culture. Well, I think I really am a wealthy man, even in terms of my culture. I have more than I ever planned or hoped that I would have. So it's important for me and I think all of us to say, God, how do I use money and not let money Use me. Here's a couple of other Proverbs. 11.4. Riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. Clear and simple wisdom from God. It cannot last beyond this world, whatever we have. It won't make it beyond the grave. And it can be lost to disaster or to whatever before then. (coughs) Proverbs 10. A slack hand causes poverty but the hand of the diligent makes rich. We don't read that like a promise. We, le- we read it like a proverb. It's wisdom for us to see that if you're lazy, it's going to hurt. If you put forth the effort, you're diligent, it's going to help when it comes to what you need and all that you need that can be supplied. So we, we don't read, the, read these proverbs and wisdom literature like they're promises but instead like, they're, like it's wisdom for our lives. So first of all, let me start here. Your kingdom heart. Your kingdom heart is where we start. And we started this series talking about how Christ has this invitation to join his, his rule, his reign, his kingdom life. He said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. <clears throat> repent. Turn, believe, and come towards me and this kingdom. And he's waiting and longing for you and I to come and join and participate with him in his kingdom. And it's a kingdom that's guaranteed success because we know the end as we know the beginning. He begins by saying repent, and he comes and then establishes his kingdom and consummates that kingdom on earth one day. So as we enter into this kingdom rule and experience with Christ, We know he wins. And I'm going to walk with wisdom with God and be on the winning team, right? (laughs) Because Christ wins, and we're a part of that guarantee of success. But it's not a game. It's a relationship. It's an experience with God. Jesus says, come. Come to me. Just come, and we'll experience this rule and this reign and participate together with this whole style of life flowing out of him inside of you. So he can change you from the heart and the inside out. So those who want the kingdom must respond wholeheartedly, repent. The kingdom's at hand. Jesus said, Matthew 13, it's like a treasure. It's to be possessed at all costs. It's to be sought after first in the present, Matthew 6, 33. And it's to be received like a humble child that's granted a gift, Luke 18. It's not something we earn, we merit, we come to Christ. He says, I'm gentle and humble of heart. I'm accessible. Just come to me. So this is the wisdom of God. And when we come and we want this kingdom heart, we know it, it will be a wise heart because God is inspiring it and giving us wisdom. Let's look at 22. The eye of the, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? So your kingdom heart treasures light. 
And, and we want our eye and our heart to be full of the light of God. Again, this is light that will flow from the throne of Christ into your heart. And then we look further into 24, 22 through 24 and following. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. And there it is. Just very simple, straightforward. How is it that, that uh, Tracy speaks of this? That it's so compelling. Christ just blasts it. It's like it's a loudspeaker. Everything's in capital letters. You cannot serve God and money. Any mysteries about that? <laughs> there it is. And we can apply that to our heart. But let's think about this because it's central to the whole section here. And let me make some notes. First of all, you cannot serve God. And some of your translations will have a different word there. Anybody have the word mammon? A few of you do. And Revised Standard Version and some others. And mammon is an idol. Uh, it reminds us that money is a form of religion. It can be the center of one's life. Uh, it demands that you pay homage through all the other details of life that go then towards money. So Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. Now, that word that's money or mammon is really an Aramaic word. And appears what has happened. Uh, Matthew is writing his gospel in Greek. And he's translating what he's been heard and told that was spoken in Hebrew and Aramaic, but he writes it in Greek so that we, a large body of original readers, can understand it. But at that particular word, he used an Aramaic word, mammon. Now, what's it mean? It means money or wealth. And that's why it gets translated there. But it is worth pausing, I think, and Wondering, why did Matthew not translate that word into Greek? Instead, he used the Aramaic word. And we can theorize about it. Uh, I think maybe we missed something by not just leaving it as mammon. And mine says money too. Because he used the Aramaic word. And it means just wealth or money, but it may be that it's possible he didn't want it to just be a neutral kind of word, like money is. That mammon really is an idol. Money can be served. Mammon can be served like an idol. And Jesus says here, do not do this. You cannot serve an idol like mammon or money. Do not do it. Peter said, there's an incorruptible inheritance, undefiled, that will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Paul said, the things which are seen are eternal. It is the things that are seen, it is the thing, excuse me, did I say that right? The things that are seen are not eternal. It is the things that are seen that are, that are temporal. Mammon is temporal. The unseen things are eternal, and it's reserved in heaven for you, and no one can steal it. <laughs> no one can take it. I was, many years ago, I, I went home. We lived in Terre Haute, Indiana. I, I was on campus for some meetings. I came home late at night. Johanna and Jason were off somewhere out of town, and I don't know why I didn't go down the alleyway to the garage, but I parked right in front of the house, which was pitch black. I walked up to the house thinking, Brad, you should leave a light on, dummy. And I unlocked the door and went in. <clears throat> and then I found the back door was open. I said, you dummy, you ought to close the door when you leave. And I went upstairs and went to bed. Went to sleep. Woke up the next morning. I thought, Brad, you ought to clean your bedroom up. I mean, all the drawers were kind of pulled out a little bit. And went downstairs and walked to my office. Totally ransacked. I'd been robbed. And I went to sleep not knowing it. 
So I called the police. They came over, and we figured out I lost like 120 bucks worth of stuff. But the speakers were unplugged on the stereo. Uh, the, the bedroom was dark, so there's a 35 millimeter expensive camera right in the chest of drawers. They'd opened all the drawers and missed the camera. The policeman says, I think they were here when you came home last night. And that's why the back door is open. They went out the back door. You know, I didn't like that. I don't like somebody breaking in my house and stealing even only $120 worth of stuff. But you know what? Everything's going to get left behind. You know, I read a story once of a guy who got buried in a Cadillac. I don't get it. Maybe it's a joke. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. You know, we have pharaohs that would, okay, I want those wives and those slaves. They killed them and put them in the tomb with them. It didn't work. You know, it doesn't work. You leave everything behind when you go. And it's the unseen things that go with you, with God and Christ. And he's storing up all the treasure for you that he has for you in the heavenly, heavenly places. I saw that a famous person died a couple of weeks ago, and you just wonder, you know, does he know your name? I mean, does Jesus call you by name? That's what you want. That's the treasure. Jesus said, what good will it do a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? Right? Well, money is also a false hope. Proverbs 11.4. Riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. There is more wisdom. It cannot last beyond this world. Matthew 6 again, right here in 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. It's going to get lost. Be more concerned about laying up treasure in heaven. And remember, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Money is also a poor friend. Proverbs 3.13. Blessed is the one who finds wisdom, the one who gets understanding, for the gain from her is better than gain from silver and her profit from gold. Gold and silver, cougarans or whatever they might be, they make a poor friend and you can't take them with you. Blessed is the one who has wisdom as a friend. So money's a poor friend. Wisdom is to be valued more than precious metals. And, and if you remember when we did uh, our series in Ephesians last fall, what God means for us to have this wisdom and to gain it as, as a community, as a body. Remember all those things we saw in Ephesians, they were all in plural. God wants us to have wisdom in plural. We gain it from one another, each other as we grow in Christ and his wisdom. So we seek first as a community what is most valuable, and we seek it hard. We seek it hard with Christ to know him and his wisdom. He said, seek his kingdom and his righteousness, and we seek it hard. We seek it first. We seek a new order because God values your heart. And he wants your heart and wants to be with you as you seek wisdom. Here is one of extreme power. Infinite power. You can't modify it. You can't add anything to it. God can't have more power. He already has infinite power. Yet he knows Luke 12 when the sparrow falls. Jesus said five sparrows could be brought for two pennies. God cares for you. How much more does he care for you than a sparrow? He values you. He values your heart. Proverbs 30, 8 and 9 has always been a proverb on this that I thought was helpful. <clears throat> Keep deception and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is my portion. I love the balance in that that I might not be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or that I might not be in want and steal and profane the name of my God. Don't you want this? 
This is good. This is great. This is holy. This is where we flourish with the wisdom of God. Well, let me cover a few ideas here on ways to defeat the money monster. That's mammon, who's always whispering. Yeah, you got it. We got it. Okay. Last time I said that, you guys, a bunch of you got it. I'm just making sure you hadn't forgotten. He's always whispering more, isn't he? Okay, ways to defeat the money monster. One, give it away. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must, must give as he's decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. I think Kevin Miller's father learned this, and he felt it and experienced it in his heart, that you can defeat the money monster by giving material things away. It's kind of, it might be kind of crude to say it this way, but you're kind of spitting in the eye of the mammon when you just give it away. And you don't, it doesn't have to be, maybe you're not wealthy and rich, but you can give something. Two, value community higher than private security. It's a temptation just to keep building bigger barns. Jesus spoke about this. What do you do when you get a bigger barn? You build it bigger. Or you build more barns to protect that barn. And then after you got those two barns, you build another barn to protect the other two barns. It never ends, the barn building. So be careful and value community higher than private security. That's barn building. And you do it with Christ. He loves the bride of the church. He loves the bride, the church. And together we value things more than we value the security of money. And third, let the money problem remind you that you have much more. Because, you know, eventually there'll be a money problem. <laughs> There's usually, they usually come around somehow, some way. And let it remind you that, you know, I got much more than that. Maybe I can't afford tires, but I can walk with God today and feel the wealth and the riches of that and not let the money monster control you. Okay, let me move into this last section and spend some minutes here. Your kingdom heart treasures light, not, not the money monster, for God tends his creation. And Luke 19, or uh, Psalm 19 reminded us of that at the very start of our, our worship today. But therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink, nor about your body, what you'll put on, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Pause for a moment. Now, there's imperatives in this text. Imperatives, we can call them commands, okay? And we make a big deal about commands and we find them in the Bible, right? Because we want to do our duty. I want to, if God says it, if Christ says it, I want to obey it. That's our heart. At the same time, I think we kind of mess up with commands at times. Because commands are used or imperatives in language are used in different ways. Now take a look at this one. There's one right there. Verse 25, do not be anxious about your life. Now is that a duty? Well, it's, I guess. <laughs> but it's kind of like telling your son, you know, go out and enjoy your, go outside and enjoy your, your swing set. Is that a command? Yes. But the kid's just being given wisdom. Go out and do this. And Jesus is saying, look, I don't want you to be anxious. Do not be anxious. Now he's going to give us a whole bunch of reasons not to be anxious. <clears throat> What's he say? Do not be anxious about life for what you will eat or what you will drink nor about your body, what you'll put on. Because your life is about more than those things. He says in verse 26, this is more reason why you shouldn't be anxious. Look at the birds. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you 
by being anxious can add a single hour to a span of life. There's another reason to not be anxious. 28, and why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Here's another reason not to be anxious. If God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow was thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? You see the sense and the power of that. Don't be anxious because this is how God loves you and likes you. He's caring for you. Well, here's another imperative. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Another imperative. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things are going to be added to you as well. You think he likes you? You think he cares for you? This is the kind of God you have. Jesus is saying, look, don't be anxious for these things, but live in a life that's flourishing with me, with God, and walk in the power of that. Therefore, 34, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. <laughs> Just good, sound wisdom flowing from the throne of God in Christ. And he wants you to flourish in that wisdom. Would you stand with me as we close our worship today?